This is the month of divine justice. And it's a very crucial month for every one of us. And I trust that the Lord will communicate to us as we do a bit of exhortation before we go into the Thanksgiving pro proper. So the topic of what I want to share with us is divine justice. Divine justice. And if you have your Bible with you, please let's go together to the book of Job. Job, Job, whichever one you prefer. Chapter 8, we read from verse 2 to 7. Job chapter 8, verses 2 to 7. How long will thou speak these things? How long shall the words of thy mouth be like a mighty wind? Doth God pervert justice? Or doth the almighty God pervert righteousness? If thy children have sinned against him, and he had delivered them into the hand of their transgress into the hand of their transgression. If thou wouldest seek diligently unto God and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. And though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end will greatly increase. Amen. Divine justice. Here we see the friend of Job coming very strongly upon him and making some emphatic statements which are obvious. And as he concluded by verse 7, by the time you get to verse 7, you see him making a prophetic utterance, but very much unknown to him. Because Job was put in the balance to be judged because of all the calamities, the evil that had befallen him. Because of all the negative things that have happened to him, the pain that he was indeed going through. Children dead, properties lost. But the friend that came to speak to him said to him, the truth is that God does not pervert justice. If you have done well, the Lord will surely keep to his time of his word. But he went on in verse 7 and, verse seven and said, And though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end will greatly increase. And we all know that that's precisely what happened to Job. By the time we get to chapter 42, verse 10 of the book of Job, we will see that the utterance that was made by this man, this is friend, who seemed to have suggested at that point in time that everything that has come upon Job was as a result of his evil doing. At the end of Job's life, we see that he was more prosperous than he was at the very beginning of his life. So come to think of justice. There are key things that we must note if we want to look at divine justice. But I want to first uh, give us some indications. In the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 19 verse 7, we may not go read in 19 verse 7 of 2 Chronicles. It tells us that there is no respect of persons. Now, taking of gifts. God does not take a bribe. God does not respect persons. He is a God that is full of justice, righteousness in all his ways. He does not in any way pervert justice. God does not in any way receive gift from anybody and then turn his eyes away from that which is right. He doesn't do that. So when you hear of divine justice, it should prompt you to a very deep, deep soul searching and examination of yourself. And so this month is supposed to be, should be a month that we will individually and even as a church go into a soul searching adventure, examination of ourselves. 
Because the truth that we all know and we must know is the fact that our God is just. There can never be injustice with him. There can never be any unrighteousness with our God. Now, when we talk about divine justice, I want to speak to us in three categories, using three dimensions. Things that we must know, things that we must understand, things that we should know when we hear about divine justice. Of course, the fact that it is divine means God is involved. That's what makes it divine, that the hand of God is in it. And so when we hear about divine justice, there are things that must come to mind. Number one is knowledge. Knowledge. For there to be true justice, there must be knowledge. For us to have justice, there must be knowledge. Without knowledge, there can be no true justice. There can be no justice without knowledge. Divine justice, therefore, operates on the bedrock of full knowledge. Divine justice operates on the bedrock of full knowledge. So when we refer to God as the God who is just, it is on the basis of his knowledge. And there is none as just, righteous, upright as our God. Because he knows all things. Human beings know in part. But God knows everything. Divine justice operates on the bedrock of full knowledge. And we all know that our God is omniscient. The God that knows all things. Nothing can be hidden. He knows your name. The scripture tells us that even the number of our, the hair on our hairs are known by him. <laughs> I believe that if we ask anybody to count the number of the hairs, even if we were to cut it and scrape off everything, it would be impossible for anybody to count the number of hairs on our head. Yet God knows all that. When the woman God visited, Hannah, was making a prayer and worship to the living God after God has visited her, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, she tells us that our God is the God of knowledge. God is the God of knowledge. There is nothing either said or done anywhere that he does not know. So when we talk about divine justice, we are talking about that justice that is based on knowledge, on what he knows, what our God knows. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10 tells us that God declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10. He declares the end from the very beginning. He is able to know everything and speak about the end of any matter from the onset because he is God. He is all-knowing. So we can never fault God. He can never be faulted. At any point in time, our God knows what he is doing in our lives. He knows precisely that he will not turn away from them that walk uprightly. Praise the name of the Lord. Number two. Apart from knowledge, the other thing is righteousness. When you talk of divine justice, the next thing that must come to mind is righteousness. Righteousness. Our God is just. He is righteous in all his ways. In everything that he does, we have heard that he will not receive a gift some of us even as Christians we receive gifts and because of gifts that we have received we are seeing the truth we turn our eyes away from the truth and behave as if we are not knowing that that's what the truth is sometimes we decide to even move in the direction that suggests that we are not there or that uh, you didn't make any contribution towards that matter meanwhile you know what the truth is that you decide to do that because you have received the gift that's part of the things that we see in the house of God. But the truth, of course, is that God knows. He cannot receive, we can't bribe God. He can't receive a gift and turn away from what is truth. Amen. Many times people have said that God is not a democrat. When it comes to righteousness, the righteousness of our God, I want to bring up these aspects. I have heard people say, I think maybe in the time past also I may have said it. 
that God is not a democrat. That God is very autocratic. He doesn't give room to anybody. So he doesn't hear what your opinion is concerning any matter. He does whatsoever that pleases him. But I do beg very greatly to differ. Even if I have said something like that in the time past, I can't say that. Scripture is full of events that portrays our God as one who is not autocratic. Those who are autocratic in their rule, in their government, they do so with evil and wicked intentions. But in the intentions of our God, in everything that his, our God does, he does it for your good, for my good, for the common good. We all recall that a, a man gave what stands up to today as the greatest definition of democracy. And that's Abraham Lincoln. He defined democracy as the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Now, I analyzed that statement spiritually and I found out that he wasn't just or the truth of the matter is that he is not just taking the people above God and say the people are the ones that matter in this matter. When people are given opportunities to participate, what that calls for is simply for the common good. And that's precisely what God does. God does his own act of justice, having your interest at heart. A man may have ulterior motives when he is dealing with you. You may not know it, but not with our God. The ways of our God are just. He is upright in all his ways. So God will never, 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 in any way, give a ruling or say anything that will be to your disadvantage or to my disadvantage. That can never be said about our God. In everything that he does, it is for our common good. Now, to prove to us that our God is righteous, he is a just God, and that he is not autocratic at all, we will recall in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. There God says to man, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before thee life and death, the blessing and the cause. Therefore choose life that thou mayest live, thou and thy seed. That's the scripture. If God were to be autocratic, he would give no room for anybody to make a choice. But we all know that our lives are full of choices. But the truth is that God is always for our common good. And so whatsoever he does, even when you as a man may not understand because you lack knowledge, but on the basis of the knowledge that he has, and being a God that is just, it ends up for your good. Now here he says to man, I say before you this day, blessing and cursing, life and death. Now he went ahead to avoid any confusion or any wrong choice. God in his justice says to man, choose life. You are seeing two things. I want you to choose life that you and your seed may live. Now, if that man decides to choose death, that cannot be blamed on God. And that cannot be said of our God when he now comes up with what follows every choice that is made. That he is autocratic. No. No. So I want you, as we are looking at it, I want you to be looking inward into yourself. Look inward. Search yourself. What are the things you have been doing, the things you have been saying? And the truth is that God knows everything that we all have done in the time past. He knows the things we have said in the secret places. He knows what we have said to ABCD. He knows whether we have used our mouth to destroy other people. And being a God of knowledge and a God that is full of justice. At the end of the day, whatsoever comes will be based on that knowledge. 
You can see me today, Pastor Prince. Okay, you go up as he can. And then, of course, because of the little knowledge you have of me, you may conclude that, oh, what a wonderful man of God. Oh, goodness. I have never seen a man such as that. That may be your opinion. But the truth is that the Lord God, who is the God of knowledge, knows everything about me. The things I do in these secret places, the things I say when you are not there. And you are giving your own ruling on the basis of what you know. But there are so many things you do not know about me. So when God begins to act towards me, he will be...